for years then we haven't even copyrighted our material we allow people to copy it to give it away that's what we want man 2020 sure has been a crazy year we're seeing so many things that no one could have predicted. Yeah, like Eric Hovind on Polygia's channel. What? What? Welcome to Polygia. We're a former Christian. Well, someone who claims he's a former Christian anyway. <sighs> Takes a look at the claims of Christians, <laughs> including that one. If you're new to the channel, please take a second to tap on the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when new science, theology, and news videos arrive. I'm guessing you're all curious as to how Eric and I ended up in the same room. Let's set the scene. Once a year, you teach a creation apologetics course. Yeah, every year I go out to Jackson Hole Bible College and I get to teach a small group of students kind of some in-depth stuff about creation versus evolution and really how do we use apologetics in the form of evangelism. What's going on when you go out there on the street and have conversations? It is an intense and very fun week with the students where by the end, we're out there talking to people. Many of these students, by the way, have really never engaged in conversations like this with skeptics or even out on the street sharing their faith. So it really is taking them from either non-Christian to Christian or from Christian to somebody who's actually doing what God has called us to do and going and loving the world in a practical way. And then 2020 hits and we got COVID-19, crazy. So no travel, no going anywhere. It forced me into the digital world. I feel like Polygia. And on my end, when I saw that your course was open to everyone, I quickly enrolled because I've always been curious about what you teach behind closed doors. I fully intended to stay silent and anonymous to respect everyone who paid to be there. But I came to learn that as part of the class, you normally have the students engage in actual conversations with atheists. That's correct. We, I love going out on blogs. We used to use PZ Myers all the time, and it's not as big of a deal anymore. So now we just go on my Facebook and say, hey, atheist friends, come have a dialogue with these fresh college students. It's, it's fresh meat for the atheists. Come enjoy and uh, always have some great conversations on there. And usually we spend about three to five hours engaging the atheists there. And the points that I'm bringing up throughout the week about the way an atheist is going to think, how they'll deny absolute truth, how they'll deny certainty about things, those end up coming up in the conversations and the students are getting firsthand experience realizing, wow, okay, it's, it's, it's true. The way they think of what we've said about this and what God's word says really is true and they need love. So then we get to Friday, which was the last day of class. And you're talking to the students as you would do in the, in the morning to break the ice. And I thought to myself, you know, Eric is struggling to find ways to talk to atheists. Maybe I should just put my hand up and volunteer. Like I had no forethought beyond that. Oh, my daughter's like, look at the q and I've got to, I don't know. What's the Q&A say? You tell me. You just come on. I don't know what it says. I have to look. Please, dad, look at the Q&A. All right. All right, sweetheart. Oh, let's see here. This is Paul. Hey, Eric, I know you'd want you'd wanted to have the class interact with an atheist. I happen to be an atheist attending your class and could potentially chat with the class if you desire. I'd be polite. Yeah, I'd, I'd love that. This would be great. So Paul, I'm so glad you did. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I can't imagine that day going any better. I thought I had scheduled Emil's Wayne for the second hour. And then I realized, wait, California time, he's third hour. That put you in the perfect spot right before Emil's Wayne for us to have a great conversation. And were you nervous at all, kind of having in the back of your head who I was? Uh, no, I wouldn't be doing what I do if I was nervous. The, the only nervous part is if I would have gotten an atheist that was a little more vocal with colorful language, and I, I wasn't worried about you saying something. So what I wasn't expecting and that I really appreciated was the openness with which you mentioned we do have presuppositions, no doubt about it. There are presuppositions. And then your conclusion, and oh my goodness, I'll, I'll let everybody watch to the end to watch this. Your conclusion, when I said, hey, how have Christians treated you in this, said to the entire class what a lot of the week was all about. And you'll have to watch <laughs> to hear what Paul actually espoused out of his own mouth or cartoon character, whichever you think it is. Okay, so without further ado, here's the conversation I had with Eric Hovind. Remember, in the context of a large classroom setting. Have a listen, and Eric and I will return afterward for a few post-conversation thoughts. 
Well, let's spend, we got about 45 minutes here and let's spend talking with Paul. And uh, Paul, thank you for joining this class. Uh, I want you to kind of introduce yourself, tell people who you are. And then uh, if you could just raise your hand, Stephanie will give you permission to talk and then just promote that to panelists. And Paul, you can start your video and we can actually enjoy a, enjoy a conversation here together. Uh, and uh, spend, a, spend maybe a minute telling us uh, who you are. Uh, did you get it? And can you see me? I'm sorry about how I appear, but that's... No, this is great. Let me uh, stop sharing the screen and... Perfect. And I can see you. Yes. All right. Perfect. Nice. How you doing, bud? I'm doing okay. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having a great class this week and for offering it to everyone online. That, that's great for we in our houses. You can't leave. Nice. Okay, so tell me, uh, to tell, tell the students, tell the class a little bit about you and uh, you, if I remember, are you the Apologia online? Is that you? That is me, yeah. Okay, so you uh, claim that you're a former Christian and now uh, don't believe that. Can you kind of give a little like summary of, of your walk or of your journey or what that's been like? Sure. Uh, so I've been a Christian all my life. I was raised in a Mennonite home uh, up until five years ago. Uh, everything Eric taught in this class, I believed with all my heart. Uh, I was a young earth creationist and, uh, and a Christian uh, about five years ago. Oh, and uh, before that, uh, I was in music ministry, youth ministry uh, for decades. Uh, used to run uh, Bible quizzing. At one point, I could quote most of the New Testament. Uh, I've lost a lot of that at this point. But um, anyway, uh, about five years ago, I started investigating some of these claims for myself. Uh, I'd kind of taken it on authority all my life uh, that what I was believing was actually true. Um, so when I went to investigate it for myself, I kind of felt like the young earth creationist part didn't hold up. Then I went to investigate the Bible because I was struggling. Obviously, if there's no Adam, this is a big problem in the Christian worldview. Um, and I, my belief in the Bible kind of fell apart uh, as a, basically I consider it a human document at this point. And um, from there, I, I lost my faith uh, and I eventually realized that I am I label myself an atheist. Some may not label me that way, so that's that's fine, however you want to do it. But that's my backstory. Uh, but I do spend a lot of time uh, investigating these claims still because this is the most important thing that you can be right or wrong about, I feel like, in your life. And so I spend a lot of time advocating that no matter what you believe, that people have good reasons for what they believe. And I like to take classes like this when I get the chance because um, if I'm wrong, obviously that's dire consequences to myself. So I don't want to be wrong about this. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. I'm curious what you're thinking uh, when it comes to, you've heard a lot of this before, you're, uh, you're not going to be kind of the average atheist out there because you do spend so much time. So I'm curious how you would kind of respond to, a give me an overview response from your perspective of what's been taught from uh, you know, the greatness of God, the design of God, God is the foundation. He's the starting point. Uh, kind of give me a, give me a summary of what you're thinking of, or what you wish you could say to all these, these students that are taking it from all well, ages. Uh, I mean, the biggest thing I would say, the biggest thing I would say, and I've tried to not be too interactive in the chat because I want people to experience the class as you intended it to. Um, I want to be respectful that way. This is your house. Um, but, you know, the thing that I would push back normally is um, how do you know that? Like, I think there was a lot of things, a lot of this, like, for example, the science claims you made in the last hour. Uh, I was kind of yelling at my screen a little bit because uh, I, uh, again, I think you, Eric, have investigated the opposite side of all of these issues. But I'm not sure everyone in the class has looked at the opposite. You know, what, what's the, I always like to ask people, what's the best argument against the thing you're about to tell me? And if they know the best argument against the thing they're about to tell me, then they know the topic. Otherwise, maybe they don't. And that was me. Uh, and it might be a lot of you in the class. I just accepted because the pastor told me that it was the earth was created in six days, but I never looked at it for myself. Uh, and if you don't look at it for yourself, you could, you either don't know it, you're just falling like a sheep, or you're going to end up like me and falling away from the faith entirely once you get kind of deconstruct. So I guess that would be the, if, if I'm trying to keep it to 30 seconds, that'd be the one thing. So let me, let me walk through and just go, you know, I, I'm, I'm real careful, especially when I'm talking to people that I know, uh, well, even like strangers, if I talk to atheists, my goal is not to, a, a lot of times people enter these conversations with a debate mentality and they're like, okay, I've got to figure out what I can say so I can get you. 
And that's not the, that's not the kind of the, the mindset that I'm in. Uh, you and I have interacted with Tim Chafee here. Uh, we're actually yep. going to be presenting that Risen Without a Doubt class cool. uh, next week and going through that. But um, so I, I'm not, and I think you know this, my goal is not to have some kind of gotcha moment with you. It's to say, okay, I'm, I'm genuinely interested in what you think about these conclusions. So when we just go with the, kind of the basic four questions that I would ask a skeptic, Yep. I'm curious how you'd respond to those. And those were, you know, the, the first question is, is it possible that God could exist? Uh, I believe it is possible that a God could exist. I don't believe it's possible that the God of the Bible exists. Okay. Uh, and then obviously we could go down that rabbit sure, trail. I, yeah, say, okay. I'm just giving you the short version. Right. Yeah, yep, 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 exactly. So, but yes, it's possible that a, now would, would the God that you're describing, now I'm talking about the God of the Bible, um, let me ask that. Why is it impossible for the God of the Bible to exist? Um, I do not believe the God of the Bible exists because uh, I have investigated the Bible itself and do not find, I find the, the book itself to be a book of, um, I'm not contradictions. I actually don't care about contradictions at all, but it's a book uh, created by men. So when I investigate uh, how the gospels came to be and how the Pentateuch came to be and all that kind of stuff, um, and then, so for, and then it comes down to, for me, there's two main arguments, and you're very familiar with them, though you don't really address them. Uh, the problem of evil, which, of course, you, you know, you talk about, that's less important to me as a divine hiddenness. Divine hiddenness, for me, was the final clincher. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the argument from divine hiddenness from, from uh, Schellenberg. I haven't read him specifically, but the very idea that God seems to be hidden from everything. Yeah, the idea that um, because... If, there's a, if there is such a thing, and you, you say because of Romans one twenty there isn't, but if there is such a thing as a person, an honest disbeliever, so someone who honestly wants to seek and cannot find God, if they are actually honest about that, then therefore it creates a big problem that God is limiting salvation from some people and some from others. Now, I know Calvinists don't care about that too much, but for me, the kind of believer I was... Um, because I sought with God with tears and prayer and on my knees for a whole, for a year before I lost my faith. And I lost, it was very costly for me to lose my faith. I lost my family and I lost a lot of things. Um, there was no reward for me on the other side. Um, but just God was not there. And therefore for me, Romans one twenty, because the only thing I can know for sure, and you talk about this a lot are my own thoughts. Um, I know my own thoughts and I know I've honestly assessed for myself whether God exists. Uh, and because I have come to, I can know my own thoughts and know that, um, where was I going with that? Because I know, anyway, because God does not exist, therefore there's a category of people that uh, cannot be saved, right? Like, so I would, I will stand, if there is a judgment day, I will stand on judgment day and say, but God, and, and I know you guys don't believe this, but um, I will, I will be able to say, God, you, I looked for you and I couldn't find you. So um, I know, you know, Romans 120 is the big one for you guys, but. Yeah, it's, it's, I get what you're saying. And I don't want to, I don't, um, we don't need to believe it. I want this to be a conversation. Yeah. And, and we can chat or, with the students or whatever you want to do. Um, so for you, it was the problem of evil and divine hiddenness that you just, you can't seem to see. God. And then, and then also just investigating the nature of the Bible as a book. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when I say, well, the, the, the Bible, the God of the Bible is an all-powerful, omnipotent creator being who cannot do anything. He cannot lie. Is it impossible for the God described in the Bible to exist? Not um, necessarily the Bible, but is it impossible for the God of the Bible to exist? Like it's, it's not, an absolute no, no, it's, no, it's, it's, it's not a logical contradiction. I like, that's why I say I, it's possible that a God exists. So if, if we're just, leaving the Bible out of it. Is it possible if there's a creator God? Sure. I don't feel like a creator God necessarily has to be uh, all knowing. They just need to be sufficiently knowing. Uh, they don't need necessarily to be loving. I can certainly imagine gods who could create a universe and walk away. You know, there, there are, you know, there could be a deistic view, for example. Um, right. So, I'm so I, don't think, I don't think there's logical contradictions in what you just said, if that's what you're asking. Okay. And even, even the idea that it could be the God of the Bible as described in the Bible, that it is possible uh, that, the that creator, God exists. The, the creator part. Uh, I don't think it's possible Jesus rose from the dead, but that's a separate issue. 
Right, but the God of the Bible, the creator of heaven and earth, the all-powerful, all-knowing, not just some knowing, but all-knowing being, it is, it's possible that he exists. Uh, sure. Okay. And then second question um, was, is it possible, is it possible, or I guess I do it impossible when I ask mm -hmm. him in the class, but is it impossible for the Bible to be what it claims to be? It claims to be revelation from God. Is that absolutely impossible? Um. Yes, I think I think it is impossible uh, because of the this the imper imperfections in it. Okay, can uh, I, I'm going so, to push you a little bit on that. Okay. And go. Is it just that you think it's impossible, or it is? It's a dogmatic. Oh, is there a, is there a logical impossibility there? Um, so not for an all knowing God, for an all loving God. Yes, because it goes back to my divine hiddenness. Say that again. It's uh, not... sorry. So. Um, because again, because uh, an all loving God, in my view, would want all believers to have a chance. Uh, and I feel at this point, until he steps and meets me, uh, I don't have a chance. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll retract this just for the sake of um, no, it's not, a, it's, it's possible God wrote this book. I don't think, I don't think then it would, it could qualify him as a per perfect God any longer. But let me grant you that it's possible that his the, he chose the imperfections and he wanted those imperfections there. Your dad often says that he wants that, you know, for example. So, yeah, um, I'm not thrilled with the way that was answered, but with the way he answered. Yeah. That. But the, so the concept is yes, God could exist, the God of the Bible. Yep. Yes, the Bible could be revelation from God. Um, whether we accept it or reject it is another thing, but it's possible that, that could be revelation from God. Can an all knowing, all powerful God? give us certainty? Can he make us certain of things, even though we can't know everything? Can he make us certain of things? So uh, this is where, so you're talking about uh, philosophical certainty as opposed to epistemic certainty, I'm guessing, since you said confidence. Yeah, well, not just a you know 99% certain. I'm, I'm saying, can, can, yeah. can he reveal himself in such a way that we, or, and, and reveal truth to us in such a way that we can know that it's true? Can an all-powerful God reveal truth to us in a way that we can know it's true? So I'm sorry, I don't have a yes or no answer for this. I'm going to try and keep my answer as brief as I can because I would take your class. So yeah. um, every person has a maximum certainty. Everyone has like a, their own 100%. Uh, and I, and I, it, it seems to be established that we can all achieve our 100% with or without God. We can be 100% certain of things that are false. We can be, you can be 100% certain, for example, that your, your spouse is faithful and then you walk in and they'll suddenly find out you were wrong. But you, you know, a minute before that, you had 100% certainty. Um, so I believe there's a maximum certainty and that if, if God exists, that he could certainly take us all to that maximum certainty, but that we would not be able to tell the difference between our own personal maximum certainty and a, and a divine maximum certainty. There's no way in our brain that we could tell the difference between those two things. But could God do that? Will take us to 100% certainty, sure. But uh, you know, again, to, to we can we can certainty. we can all be at maximum certainty about things that are false. Right. I'm saying, could God reveal truth to us in such a way that we could know that it's true, even though we don't know everything? Could a God do actually that next step that you're saying? Not, I'm not talking just about our own thoughts and our own. Could God make us infinitely certain about some things? I don't see how. Let me ask you, how would I know the difference between my own personal maximum certainty and a divine maximum certainty? Well, that's another question down the road. My question is, is it possible? I, I don't see how it's possible. I don't see how it's possible to so know. It's, are you saying it is impossible? I'm saying God? God can take us to maximum certainty. I do not see how we could possibly, like, and that's just confidence. And confidence means nothing. I believed in the Bible with 100% certainty. I dedicated my life to it. You know, so I was 100% certain. Um, but in, I now believe that to be false and it felt hundred percent certain. So I guess like my answer is obviously God can take us to hundred percent, but I can also take myself to hundred percent. So I don't know what the functional difference is. I guess because it comes down to, cause you know, obviously next I'm going to ask, uh, could you be wrong about everything you think, you know, uh, that's the next, that's question your, that's your, that's the question, uh, in, in, in those series that I yeah, was and that's the question now. I least like of yours. So, uh, it, there's, there's a difference between is there everything wrong between what you know and everything wrong with what you think you know. So obviously I can't be wrong with everything I know because like, for example, I know I'm not God. I just know I'm not. 
God knows everything. God can do everything. I can't. So there's so, one thing, for example, that I can ground that I know. Um, everything that I think I know is about confidence as opposed to epistemic certainty. And I know these are philosophical terms and I'm really sorry for the class if I'm boring. I know, you. I just, I, you and I understand these terms. And so if you're uh, but, under but 16, I just want to, I kind of want to, I'm not, I'm trying not to be too complicated, but I also do want to give the class an example of someone who, uh, you know, has thought these things through a little bit and won't just give the answer. Yes or no. I'm sorry. I could play the script, but um, no, no, I get it. And I, I don't mind. I don't mind. Yeah. Quote veering off the script. I'm just saying, I still believe that if you were, if I, if I asked the question and kind of kept holding your feet to the fire, could you be wrong about everything you think you know? And, and then we go down to, you know, that whole, that whole circular problem that, that's going to happen. And I say, well, how do you know things? Well, so I guess, unfortunately, my answer is no, I don't think I can be wrong with everything. I don't think I can be wrong then, with everything I know. I and then the next I, question is, okay, what do you know and how do you know it to be absolutely certain? You gave one example. You said, you know, you're not God. I know I'm not God and I know, I my, say, own, and I know my own thoughts. I know right. I'm aware of the content of my own thoughts. And then um, I would ask, I would go down that road of, you know, are, are there people that, that exist in a hospital bed somewhere, but they think they're, and they're strapped down in a psychiatric ward, but they think that they are sitting in front of a computer having a conversation. Oh, there, so... Yeah, those people, like my thoughts can be wrong, but I'm aware of the content of them. Like I can't be wrong about the content of my thoughts. My con, I could, yes, I could imagine, hey, I'm sitting in a, you can't, I'm in a blue room and I could, I think I'm in a pink room, um, but I can be confident. I can know for certain that my thought is that I think I'm in a pink room. I can't know for certain if I'm in a pink room. So the two examples I like to give are, I know I'm not God and I know the content of my own thoughts, which is partially why I reject Romans 1.20. So the the logical problem is you, now you're using your reasoning to validate your reasoning. Is that correct? You're using your thoughts to validate your thoughts. No, I don't have to. Like my thoughts could be entirely unreasonable. It's just. So that what I'm are aware you using to validate that you're aware of your thoughts? Uh, at that point, I am reading. Um, it's not, it's not it's not necessarily logic at that point. It's 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 pure synopsis firing. It's it's sensory perception. So. Uh, so for example, if I think I'm in a pink room and I'm not, uh, I'm a, my sense, my sense, I'm using my senses and I'm using other things to validate uh, what I'm doing. And then you, you, we, we kind of jumped over truth or maybe that's in the script, but for me, truth is that which comports to reality, which I think is your definition as well. Well, I would change it a little bit because that's a correspondence theory of truth. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. Now, who's reality? How do you know? Well, and so real? for me, the, the yeah. answer to that second half of the question is what, uh, what, uh, via predict, adjudicated by predictive power. So it's not my own mind that ever, uh, that ever is the judge. It's, it's predictive power. So if I think there's a door, uh, that's great. But if I can't walk over and walk and leave the room, then there was no door. Like, uh, so uh, it's, it's predictive power, making predictions based on what I think uh, is what tells us what conforms to reality best and what doesn't. Does that make sense? Um, and I, I don't understand. Yeah. This may not be the thread you want to go down. Sorry. No, I understand what you're saying. I am kind of going, I hear, uh, I see uh, Eliza saying, I'm kind of confused. <laughs> and I'm yeah. going, I know I, we just went down really, really deep. And in my mind, Paul, I'm going, I would love to create a hangout where you and I do a hangout and invite other people just like this. But uh, instead of having it be a class on Christian apologetics, have it be specifically on that. But I, 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 I can't, part of me wants to keep going down this because I enjoy this getting down in the philosophical arguments of can sure. we know truth. It still sounds to me like you're saying you're validating your thoughts using your thoughts. You're validating your reasoning using uh, your reasoning. I've not validating. Val I can only validate the contents of my thoughts uh, with my own thoughts because no one else shares them. So there's literally no one else who can validate my thoughts for me. Um, and, and, so and would you say that your thoughts are just, the byproduct of chemical reactions, synopsis in the brain. Yes, synopsis yes. In the brain, and that's I, I, I've, I've yet to find, see evidence uh, of anything otherwise. So then we ask the question, does it make any sense to call one chemical reaction true and one chemical reaction false? Uh, only if you can, via a third party, via making predictive power, uh, align it to react, see if it corresponds to reality or not. And the, the what do you, um, the correspondence theory of truth. Now we have to ask, okay, what is real? And do you, do you think you can, how would you validate that you know what is real? <clears throat> Again, you have to make predictions. Like I said, so if I think there's a door, if I can go, if I can go use the other senses 
uh, to touch the door, feel the door, smell the door, and then like actually not just use my senses, but actually walk through the door and leave the room, then I can have an increased confidence that there is a door. Uh, so for me, we like, again, truth is a, for me, truth is a spectrum. And I know that it, it, this doesn't, this isn't this subjective truth that whatever is true for me, I don't believe any of that garbage at all. Uh, I believe there is an abs- there's a truth. And for me, the truth is adjudicated by reality. So, um, if there's a door, the door is there. Um, I lost then, track. A lot of other questions. Sorry. That's okay. Cause where, where I would go from there is, okay. Are there people in a psych ward that think there's a door there? They feel the door. They think they're walking through the door. They think they walked outside. Now they're playing a football game, but the reality is they're strapped down to a table, but they think that their senses actually confirmed what they were thinking. They think that's what's happening. Right. And that's actually why I, I specifically mentioned when a third party can also evaluate for you, like with, you know, the more, the more parties you can have evaluate, but that person laying in the psych ward could think that a third party is validating what they are saying. Um, they could, in their mind, think that they, that they walked out the door with them. So all of that could still be, quote, validated in their mind as a reality when the true reality, the truth is they're strapped down to a table in a psych ward. Uh, yeah, I guess and in one sense, uh, that person, the fact that that person is, is getting it wrong you're, as you're absolutely right, it doesn't, that doesn't affect reality. reality. Truth is truth, no matter what the person perceives. Uh, that person is an unfortunate situation. Um, yeah, and that's where I would say that's what takes it outside of what you're trying to claiming is truth, is truth is that which comports to reality. Truth is that which comports to the mind of God, that which is truly real, because there are people that can have a false perception right. of a reality. Because, of course, I would ask you, Paul, how do you know you're not that person who thinks he's talking to me in a blue room, but in reality, you're strapped to a psych ward? What would you use? And you would continue to use an, a, a viciously circular argument of your own thoughts, your own reason. And you, I, you know, man, you had somebody walk in your room. You had me on the computer saying, I'm talking to you, Paul. And it all validated, but you don't know that that is real. Correct. Actually, and none of us, like, and so I actually would affirm that I can't at that point. I can't... I, we, uh, I don't like the brain of that stuff. I don't like any of that stuff. But I'll, honestly, we, you know, as you know, we all have to presuppose something, right? And I, I'm fully on board with uh, if, if an atheist tries to push you back that they don't have presuppos- presuppositions, don't buy it. Atheists have presuppositions like crazy. We do. Uh, mine are that the universe exists, that we can learn about it, uh, and that um, there are other minds you know, that's, those are some of my presuppositions, for example. And I, I can't justify those beyond a presupposition. Okay. I was going to say, yeah, you could be wrong about them, right? Absolutely. And, and, and so we, we use the presuppositions that are best, um, that, you know, best give us the best outcomes. They're, you know, that seem most true to us. Um, in your view is God. So I'm saying that whatever conforms to reality, I feel like I'm okay if God exists and he eventually reveals himself to me still with that definition, because isn't God, part of reality as well? Like, I know that you would think that he's the super set of reality, but wouldn't God also be in the set of things that are real? Well, I guess that opens the question of, is God a spirit? Because I believe, yes, God is a spirit and has, he has revealed himself through all of nature. Everything is evidence of God. Me sitting here is evidence of God. This pen is evidence of God. It, it is not God, but it is evidence of, and everything in existence is evidence of God. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. I'm curious what you thought about when I put up, you know, logic, science, math, uh, logic, science, and morality are universal, immaterial, and unchanging. How could a material world come up with those things? If you don't start with God, you don't sure. get these things. I'm curious what you thought. So what you're thinking. Uh, for me, uh, logic is a property of the universe, much like, um, so the universe, the universe that we exist in has, has many properties and, and you sometimes call the, the laws of science laws, but they're not, they're properties. Like, so um, just like a property of my mug is that it says creation museum on it. Um, a property of the universe are the three laws of logic of uh, the non-contradiction uh, identity. And uh, I'm listing the third one for the second. Anyway, there's, there's the, the, the principle of logic to me, are merely a property of, of the universe. Um, so I, let me ask I you don't this. think, go ahead. It, is it possible that before the universe came into existence, that there were no 
There was no such thing as logic. Uh, those three properties as well. So I don't, I don't know that before the universe existed is a coherent question. So I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Okay. So is it possible? But what you're saying is logic is a property of the universe. In other words, correct. Like, the, like laws of contradiction, like a thing can't be a thing that it's not like, it can't be a and not a at the same time. Right. I, I just think that's a property. Okay. And here's my point is if it's a property of the universe, yep. then before we had a universe, <clears throat> you did not have these properties, these laws. I'm so, not convinced that before we had a universe is a coherent question. That's my problem. So, but if they are a property of the universe, the universe changes, can logic change? Are they, uh, are they material in nature or is there an immaterial world? So a property doesn't need to be material. Like red isn't a material. Like right. is, is red material? No, it's a, no, it's but a, something can be a, red. So, so sure. In that sense, it's, you know, the fact that a can't be a, which is one of the laws of logic, that's not material, but it is a, it, it doesn't change. As far as we know, the universe doesn't change. I, I believe in generally in uniformitarianism. Um, that the universe doesn't change. And there's lots of things like, so I don't think the speed of light has ever changed, for example. That's a property of the universe. But you would say that the universe did come into existence by itself. That's a pretty big change. No, I don't think it. Oh, so uh, our instantiation of space time came into being. I actually don't think that, like you, you say space time and matter, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think that matter. And I'm not a cosmologist. I've talked to lots of cosmologists and we debate about this, but I don't think that, uh, that energy slash matter uh, came into existence. I think you need a brute fact to eliminate the finite regress, infinite regress. Uh, and so I think that energy is the thing that is eternal. So I actually don't think that before is coherent. Okay. So does, well, does that make any sense? I don't know. Yeah. I understand yeah. what you're saying. I, as far as, um, and sorry, I'm, I'm, is doing this helpful less, to the class? <laughs> I'm doing less teaching with this and more just conversation with this, but I think that's fine. Um, so the idea that energy is eternal uh, mm -hmm. Did and energy is what gave rise to the material world? Right. So like in Big Bang cosmology, for example, like um, we can, it's, it's not, you, you often say that space, time and matter came into existence at the Big Bang. That's not actually what scientists believe. Scientists believe that space and time came into existence at that point, but that matter, you know, that there was, um, you know, the, the, the dot that exploded is what you say, which drives me crazy because it didn't explode. But um, you know what I'm talking about. Um, they call it the Big Bang, though. Yeah, they call it the Big Bang, and that was a pejorative because the people didn't who didn't believe it named it. Um, the like so before that Planck time, before the first start of our instantiation of space time, I believe that energy was already there, and you know it's it's the singularity that the scientists talk about that existed beforehand. So there was a singularity, and that singularity had expanded infinite, had infinite energy. Yeah had all the energy and that singularity expanded to create the universe that we Right, have. we don't know that it had all the energy. It had some of the energy at least. But where did all the where did other energy come from? Well, that's where we get down to brute facts. Like obviously every and you can press atheists on this cuz they don't they're not comfortable with this. I've become comfortable with it. You cannot have an infinite regress of causes. You know, um and so uh everyone has to either accept or not accept that there is a brute fact. You guys, um, you and many members of your class think that God is the brute fact, that God is an uncreated thing. Um, I happen to accept that energy is an uncreated thing. We know that it can't be created or destroyed. Um, that, that's how the universe makes most sense to me. Is that energy is eternal. Correct. Okay. Um, if, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, just for sake of the class, um, so we said it is possible that God exists. It's possible that Bible could be a revelation from God. Uh, on that third one, it was kind of a, a question, but ultimately God can make us as certain as we can be, and then that's it. But we can't have like the, the, the absolute certainty of God is what you're saying. Then when I said, could you be wrong about everything you think you know, you said, ultimately, yes, but I, I can know my thoughts. And then we went down the road of, well, yeah, could so your I thoughts can be wrong just about any, be... Right, I can be wrong about any given thing. I can't be wrong about everything which is a weird, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I think you're trying to, uh, try, trying to manipulate that because when we got down to your thoughts and said, well, could your thoughts even be wrong? Could you be, we said, well, yes. And you know, well, this is the difference between epistemic certainty and philosophical certainty. So I can be hundred percent confident about things that I'm wrong about. I can be 
I can have very low confidence about things that are actually true. Um, so this is one of those weird, when you, when you mix certainty with what do you actually know, that's where it gets problematic. And sometimes I feel like in these conversations, the theists that I talk to switch back and forth between confidence and whether or not something's true. Okay. Um, for sake of the class, I yep. do want to kind of, uh, let's, cause let's, I, I normally girl. just, hey, just so the class knows normally, I would keep pushing Paul right here and hold his feet to the fire. And you know, I would do that, Paul, cause you've seen me do it with other people. And I would just keep saying, but you know, how do you know, how do you know, how do you know, how do you know, could you be wrong? Could you be wrong? Could you be wrong? And every claim you make of, I don't believe the Bible or this or that, any claim you make or evolution is true, or this proves this, I would just keep holding your feet to the fire of how do you know, how do you know, how do you know, how do you know? Um, for sake of kind of the creation part of the class, the, the idea yeah. of God created the heavens and the earth. First of all, tell me what you think about the fact that normally I would hold your feet to the fire there and how, how you feel like uh, a, 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 quote, trained atheist should, should handle that. Well, I, again, I, it's the exact same thing I was talking about. I feel like um, you are switching back and forth between certainty and things that and just general and epistemic knowledge, which are things that are true, whether we believe them or not. Um, and if we had time to go into it, we would suss out whether that's a meaningful distinction or not. Um, but I, again, I just would emphasize that you can be super confident in things that aren't true. You can be very unconfident about things that happen to be true. None of that affects what really is true. Um, and what really is true is independent of, of my brain. Um, and, and yeah, okay. does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to some of the information presented, um, the, uh, the idea that God created the heavens and the earth versus the evolution idea that we, that it evolved. Tell me what that journey has been like for you and what you've learned um, on, on the whole evolution time scale that somehow life really did evolve from something that was not alive. Uh, like, like hit, hit, hit sure. that for example. Sure. Hit the main point. So um, I mean, one of the things I had to, as a younger creationist, I was not exposed to evolution ideas at all. Uh, I, I'm basically five years in, uh, but Let's reconcile this. So we talked about the Big Bang 13.8 million years ago or so, uh, and 4.3 million years ago, the Earth exists. That's what scientists tell us based on um, radiometric dating and lots of other different um, uh, light distance problems, all these kind of things. That's what they tell us. Um, abiogenesis, though, I think is the big thing you want to talk about, which is, of course, life coming from non-life. Um, so you, you spoke about Miller-Urey this morning. Uh, and obviously, I would agree with you. If anyone says Miller-Urey created life, they absolutely did not. Uh, no one has created life yet. Uh, but what we have created, and, and there's, there's been about 50 experiments after this since, uh, they create amino acids. They are close to getting, they're, they're getting the basics of RNA coming together. And uh, there's a paper in 2019 that basically you're getting almost everything you need for RNA. Um, and again, so the switch from chemical to biological, biology is really just chemistry. And so, yes, uh, there is, the scientists haven't aligned the dots yet between um, amino acids and life, but uh, most of us who accept that abiogenesis happened, um, just, you know, again, as Eric said, we don't know yet, but we don't plug in, therefore God, for things we don't know yet. I know Eric would say, oh, you're saying therefore science. Uh, what what an honest person would say is we don't know. Hopefully, if you're in, hopefully if you're having conversations with a non-believer, they would at least be honest enough to say we don't know because we don't. Um, okay. Yeah. Is that is that fair? Yeah, and I would agree. Uh, we don't know, and obviously, I would say uh, here's another thing. Have, have you ever used the phrase "God of the gaps"? Would you call? Would you? Say, I have. Un I have used that phrase, though I try not to as much anymore. Okay. Tell me why you don't. Uh, I try not to use God of the gaps partially because I, I think there's just a visceral reaction to, to saying it. But the principle I feel is, is actually sound. The principle that um, we don't know, therefore God uh, is not, a, it doesn't follow. Um, so uh, in, so for in the past, obviously people like to give the example of, well, we don't know, people didn't know where lightning came from. So they decided, Oh, well, maybe it's God striking a hammer against the cloud and that creates lightning, you know, um, Obviously, that wasn't true, but it was what they used to explain it. Um, and so for me, God of, God of the Gaps is any time where, for example, you were talking about, um, you know, genetics and these kind of things. No, that's a bad example. Um, anyway, I think you understand God of the Gaps, what, I, what I'm saying there. Did that answer your question? 
It does, yeah. And here's what I would point out. I want you to tell me what you think about this. I would say I'm not a God of the gaps. I'm a God of everything. God is the God of the lightning that we do know in the electrical processes and actually what's going on with the ions. He's the one who created this concept, this idea, the science, the laws. He's the creator of the laws and he's the creator. He's the one who did everything we don't understand yet. Right. So tell me what you think about that. I'm not just a God of the gaps. I'm a God of everything. Right. And that's partially um, why, because I was a former Christian, I can sometimes get my head better into some of these things because uh, I believe the same thing. Um, what, I've, what I now come to see is if you have an explanation that is an explanation for everything, like no matter what we found, you can say, well, God did it that way. Um, when you have an explanation for absolutely everything and it's not falsifiable, then you really have an explanation for nothing. And that's why some atheists who don't think about this very clearly will just throw out there, oh, it's a flying spaghetti monster or a pink unicorn or something, you know, universe creating pink unicorn they will throw at you. Um, it, the point they're trying to make is that if you, have an, if you come up with an explanation that can't be falsified, then obviously it's an explanation for everything, right? Like there's, uh, and, it's, and it's ultimately unhelpful. That's, what I, that's where I go. So would you apply that to the abiogenesis that because people say God had to create life, life is so complex, life is so, you know, look at our bodies filled with trillions of cells, every cell more complex than the space shuttle. This had to have a designer. Do you think that Christians are looking at that and saying, therefore we don't have to study it? Because when I hear people say God of the gaps, I go, sounds to me like they're just saying, anybody who doesn't want to understand how it works is a God of the gaps, where I go, no, I'm a God of everything, including studying how God did it. Tell me what you think about that. Uh, I respect people like that. And obviously we've had many Christians who've made great strides in all these areas. Um, you know, Christian, Christian, Christians, have, Christians can be scientists just like Muslims can be scientists and everyone can be scientists. So um, that's not wrong. I would say ministries like yours that do young earth creation, though, I feel like um, that there are – the you're poking holes in a lot of things, but without trying to, without trying to, to, to study why or how, for example, your, your whole population thing that you did with Phil Nye, um, you know, you, you said, well, you came up with one number and you said, well, this number somehow just accounts for war and famine and these kind of things. Well, if you look at the population charts over time, uh, populations go down, populations go up. We ha you can see where wars happen. You see where famines happen. There's no one number that's going to match a curve. And I feel like uh, anyone who comes to a thing saying, this is the answer and what data fits the answer. And that includes me. If I say, uh, I believe that this is a process without God and that's my presupposition, I'm going to come to the wrong conclusions. And so um, I feel like bias is a big, important thing there. And I lost the train of your question. Yeah, hmm. That's okay. I was just simply saying, how do we, how do we, um, um, well, now I'm forgetting my original question, but uh, I, th because I think my, Christian, my brain I think was Christian's, going on human population. Oh, God of the gaps. Uh, I'm a God of the gaps. God, yeah, yeah. Um, for God of the gaps, please don't. You know, I would say if you want to be intellectually honest, people don't don't use God of the gaps. Use more like what Eric is saying is I believe God created DNA, and that I think Eric would agree with me that uh, the truth has nothing to fear from facts. We can learn. We could learn 70 new facts tomorrow about all kinds of things. And I think Eric would, is confident, and I'm also confident, that all of those facts are going to fit within reality. Um, I think, I hope that I'm the kind of person that though if, the, if a fact contradicted what my idea already was, that I would change my ideas. Um, but that obviously, I think Christians shouldn't be afraid of science because if God is true. If, if the God of the Bible is true, he has nothing to fear from it. I think that's where you're going with that, right, Eric? I'm certainly there. I, I, at the age of 18, I began to wonder, is what I've been taught all my life really true? And it sent me on a journey of going, okay, it, could evolution be true? And the more I looked at the science of it, the more I looked at the reality of it, I went, there's no possible way this could be true. It wasn't until later that I discovered, wow, wait a minute, you have to start with God in order to get these immaterial things. You have to, God has to be the starting point. God has to be the foundation. Yeah. And you so have to have that. I know Emil's coming on soon. So I, I but um, just to get some of the things, like, for example, I don't think that moral facts exist. Like I just don't like you, I, no one's ever convinced me that a moral fact is a fact. And so when you talk about these immaterial things, um, 
that doesn't to me make anything supernatural, right? These are just properties of natural things. Um, so that's now, one when of the you places- say- when you say they, uh, the, the moral facts don't exist, I mean, when we, even the extreme examples I gave, you'd mm-hmm. say, we can't say it's absolutely a moral fact that, that, you know, raping, torturing, and murdering a child for fun is absolutely morally wrong? Under my, under my moral system, it is wrong. Under your moral system, it is wrong. But, but outside, if, if, if no humans existed, uh, there's no such thing as a, being wrong to murder humans like okay well, but if what i'm saying is if somebody said my claim is that raping torturing and murdering children for fun is right and i'm gonna go do that does uh, that therefore make it right and is it just no absolutely well opinion? this so um does it make it it makes it right to you the hypothetical person who posed that i'm not gonna put words <laughs> I don't wanna... but that's what i'm saying is does that really make it right or is it still it's a, still a the... universal wrong or if a majority let's just say 99 percent of people believed that raping and murdering children for fun was the right thing to do and that's what they were doing would that make it right so i think that right and wrong are a spectrum uh, of things that and right is the label that we give to things that best achieve the goals that we want and wrong is the label we give to the range of things that least achieve the things we want if you as a species want to survive and live longer uh, raping and murdering and all kind of things, uh, that is going to bode poorly for you and your species will quickly be eliminated. But no, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a quick answer. I don't think there's such a thing as an absolute wrong. No. So if somebody thought that was okay, or a majority of people thought that was okay, that they could do that. And regardless of how well, I mean, what if it was just, Hey, one kid a year, we're just going to do this as a group, get together. It's not going to affect our population size. We're going to survive. No problem. We just, we just think this is the good thing to do. That, I, that would be very much against my preference, very much against my preference. But, but you, you, you really wouldn't have a, a, a choice in the matter, right? If, if that's just- No, I wouldn't. And, and this, is, uh, this is very and, consistent with what we've seen in he- history. And if they believe that, you wouldn't try to stop them because that's what they believe. Well, I would try to stop them because it's very much against my preferences. I would absolutely try to stop them. So how because we, and I would how I would we, attempt to on the basis of the only time people can come to common morality is where they have common goals. Um, appealing to a common authority like a god makes no difference to me because I don't think God exists. So we can't make it. God isn't a good tiebreaker for morality. What you need to appeal to, and this is what we see in reality, is you need to appeal to common goals. So we would say, you know what, if we go around murdering people, um, your life isn't going to be great because you're going to be constantly looking around your shoulder saying, am I the next one to be murdered? People don't want to live that way. And I would have, you would have to come to a common ground and appeal to it that way. But you're okay. But yeah. you're assuming that you're going to be looking over your shoulder, all that stuff. Um, I, um, man, it is 12 o'clock already. I Sorry. I don't know. I don't know if this, I was hopeful for the class. I hope it was. I, I, um, I think at the end of the day, I think it is. I really okay. do. And, uh, and how, how many of you go, Hey, at the end of the day, Raise your hand if you go, okay, that was at least interesting. I enjoyed hearing that conversation. You're a panelist. You should be able to see. Yeah, most people are, a lot of people are raising their hand right now. Okay, saying, good. Yeah, this is very, very interesting. I um, only said this because I knew you'd like to talk to atheists and I thought I was, I was around. So you, this was, this is great. And I, Paul, I would love to just dialogue in more conversations about this. Um, I would enjoy putting together a little a little conversation with, with, with you and just putting it out there as a webinar. I think. That'd okay. Be great. Well, I hope. I hope that I've proven to you that I'm, I'm open to having great conversations with you and I'm hoping there's chances for us to do that in the future, Eric. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, I'm just wondering how to wrap that up because I hate leaving it just right there. I mean, obviously there's so much we could talk about and, and maybe if you're, uh, if you're taking the class as a Christian, you can understand. I really do. To me, these are, are invaluable, these kind of conversations because they're, they're helping us understand what, what do, do, does what I believe, does it really hold up? Is it true? Is it really true? And um, uh, so anyway, Paul, I really appreciate it. And yeah. um, just so the class knows at some point, uh, regardless of what you say, now, now I guess it depends. Uh, for, for you, Paul, I don't yep. know that I would go into quote the good person test and actually go, I mean, go, well, hey, what do you think about this? Because I don't feel like we've got a solid foundation for what is reality? Do we have a common place to even begin the discussion before we move on to all these other things? Can we even know truth? And when I'm talking to someone who says, 
I, I don't know if truth, you know, can be really known outside of my own thoughts. And then I go, well, it's kind of hard to debate the human population or, you know, the dinosaur soft tissue or the fact that we see fossils. Or It's hard to debate any of these things with somebody who says the only thing I can know to be true is my own thoughts. And I can even push and show, well, even that I can turn upside down. Does that, tell me what you thought, as an atheist, tell me what you think about that. Uh, that's actually why I, I delved in, I don't like philosophy. I'm sure Eric probably didn't either <laughs> until, until, you know, you start to, we, when you, as we said, everyone has common evidence. So then you're looking at that and you, you start to go deeper and deeper on thoughts. Uh, yeah, that's why I think that our conversation, unfortunately, I'd love to discuss whether the moon is receding or not with you, but you're right. We need to get to the other things first. So uh, I, I agree with you. And I think hopefully this models the kind of conversation that people can have uh, with an atheist at some point and that you do probably need to get some common ground as Eric was trying to get to. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to be talking past each other and you're, neither of you are going to value from it. Is that fair? So, it's great. Tell, tell my class real quick, this, this idea that I've tried to present throughout the whole class of, listen, you are called to love one another. Uh, tell me what you've seen out there from, quote, Christians, right. from people who claim to be Christians. Tell me what you, as somebody who says, I've, I've come out of that, I'm going to call myself an atheist now. Tell me what you have experienced from the, quote, Christian community. Okay. So um, shortly after, I, I was outed against my will. I'd been attending church for about half a year thinking I was an atheist. Uh, I can, I admitted it to one person and that person proceeded to tell everyone, which is unfortunate because I didn't get a chance to spin my message. Uh, what happened to me, me immediately was I was almost every one of my friends and everyone I was in business with. And I was, I only knew Christians in my life. Almost all of them abandoned me immediately, um, which was unfortunate. Uh, and I actually got quite sick several months after that. And a lot of them messaged me out of the blue just to say, you know, God's getting you now. See what happens when you become an atheist? You are sick now because God did this to you. So all that said, my parents and my sister and, and one other person continued to love me and continued to be in my life, even though we disagreed on the most important thing you could possibly disagree on. Um, and if I ever come back, it will be because of the love of that handful of people who continued to love me Eric is absolutely right. Um, the, those five, the, that handful of people are going to be the ones that can potentially reach me. Uh, the ones who shunned me, I don't know what they gained from it. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, okay, maybe they're protected from my ideas, but we shouldn't be uh, scared of ideas, obviously. Um, and I think Eric is also right that the only thing that can bring me back, I've come to this conclusion, and I've prayed about this many times, is if the Holy Spirit reaches out to me because I have investigated every claim. I keep coming to classes to see if there's something new, but until the Holy Spirit, and this is why I talk about divine hiddenness, until the Holy Spirit reaches out to me, um, I'm probably not coming back based on intellectual arguments. So what, what people need to do if they want me to come back is, is pray for me rather than argue with me, probably. Um, that's that in, a, in a tight a nutshell as I can put it, that's kind of my experience. I don't know if you have questions about that. I just sit here and I go, Paul, that is, I, I couldn't have said it. I, I, no example could teach these students what you just communicated. Uh, no amount of my teaching could communicate what you just, uh, what you just communicated. And I, I just, I really appreciate that very much. And well, in, in a way, I'm sorry to help, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very thankful uh, for you saying that. And let, let me share with the class what I think. Stay on just for a second. Let yep. me share what I think, and then I want you to just respond to this, and uh, then easy is already here. Um, I, um, I think there are a lot of, quote, Christians that are scared to death of ideas that you now have or ideas that are out there. And so that's exactly what they're doing, is they're trying to shield themselves and protect themselves from any, any idea that could interrupt their faith. And I, I remember at age 18, I went, look, I want to follow the truth where it really leads. I, I don't want to pretend to be right and not be right. I don't want to deceive myself. And so I went, I am open to anything anybody has to say. I want to hear it because I want to match up what I know to be true. Now, once I know something to be true, I don't want to reject it. Once I know two plus two equals four, I'm not open any longer to it being five or six or a million like we gave in our example in class. 
once I know the truth, I want to close my mind on that truth. But I'm convinced that are, there are a lot of people out there that do not have a proper faith, a proper, the, the word confidence, I hear you use that a lot, a lot. The word confidence literally means it's from the Latin confide with faith, a proper faith, a proper confidence in who God is. And so they're scared of ideas. You know, uh, Sai gave the example of they, they, they get scared and they, they throw the bike down and they run away when the cop comes mm-hmm. after them. And it's like, uh, we, as Christians, we really have nothing to fear by the, you know, and it really is a matter of loving others. And Paul, I certainly hope uh, in the couple of years, I know I haven't had time to kind of interact. I've, I've watched several of your videos on YouTube. I haven't had a chance. I, I got several people going, man, you should just start responding to those. And I'm going, I, I don't like getting into these YouTube battles, so to speak, back and forth. I prefer real genuine conversations. And it just seems like that kind of gets out of hand when you do that. So uh, well, I hopefully hope I've demonstrated nothing, for you that that's possible. Yeah. Well, oh, no doubt about it. I'm just saying, I hope that nothing I've done in the past has demonstrated to you that I am uh, trying to do the opposite of, I'm being the hypocrite. I'm doing the opposite of what I'm teaching, but respond to the idea that, that there could be a lot of people quote in the church that, that are afraid of your ideas. Cause I think the way you just said that was, was beautiful. Uh, thank you. And, and I guess, so part of it is, I, I honestly believe that if you don't know, if you don't know the best arguments against your idea, and this is something I wish you would, you would share a little bit more as the best arguments against these ideas. Um, then you then you don't know your own idea and you are subject to being tossed and turned by the wind as the Bible says, <laughs> blown by the wind, right? Um, so even you need to look at, you need to look at the other side. You need to look at the other religions to, to test whether if you, if, if you, there's no, God has no grandchildren as they say. Um, so, you, you know, you need to test this stuff for yourself. Um, and I guess what I would say I, yeah, I lost track of the question because I got, got down. Yeah, just how do, how, do you, how do you respond to, um, to the Christians that kind of walked away from you? Oh, or um, you and... so, I mean, to me, I think that basically you're demonstrating, uh, you're demonstrating to the person that they were right in leaving in that way. You're, you're, demonstra- you're basically giving a demonstration that there, there is no proper foundation for that person's faith and that it's just a personal preference. You're kind of, unfortunately reinforcing all those things. Now you don't have to have a debate about those things to say it, but you do need to, uh, by shunning the person, by isolating them, by not having any talk, talk with them, you're showing that you don't love them and that the, by the, you know, by the fruits that shall be known, uh, yeah. you're not showing those fruits. Uh, and so if you're not comfortable with that atheist talking about these philosophical arguments, don't worry, talk about, the fact that basketball is canceled, talk about something else. Like if you don't uh, have relationships with people, you should have relationships with people who you disagree with. That is, I, I believe firmly that uh, if, if all of your friends think the way you do, then you haven't tested yourself properly. So um, I hope I've demonstrated that at least, you know, it's through prayer, it's through the Holy Spirit, these kind of things that you can have a chance of winning uh, if, if these things exist. Well, I think it's interesting that there are definitely Christians, and as Paul just talked about, that have not shown what God's Word clearly teaches. By this shall all, mo- know, all men know that you're my disciples, <clears throat> if you have love one for another. And then I'm going to have Christians going, why did you do that? Oh, boy. The ripple effects of good, honest conversation. It's going to be the same for me on the atheist side. This was totally spur of the moment, completely unprepared. So there are a few places I wish I'd answered differently. And I know my fellow skeptics will say, why didn't you hold Eric's feet to the fire on science question X or theology question Y? But that just wasn't the point. I wasn't there for Eric. I was legitimately hoping to help a class of students understand an opposing view of things. Along that lines, for all of you that are like, you should have said this, you should have said that. Yeah, you can email all that to Paul. Paul, I'll let you handle all those emails. I don't want any of them. Yeah, just leave them in the comments. Yeah. Well, let's just keep modeling real good conversations then. Okay, Paul, what, what was your favorite part of that? A couple of years ago, if I'd have said, I get a chance to talk to Eric Hovind, I would have said, great, I'm going to pin him down on science question X, science question Y, science question Z. And I like that... I have now come to a place where I would much prefer to have an honest and open conversation to explore ideas 
than for us to clash. Uh, my favorite part was that you and I could model what conversations should be like for people who disagree fundamentally on a lot of things. I think that's great. I think that a lot of times people enter these discussions as though I'm going to be the next debater and I'm going to get that clip on YouTube that gets a million views. And man, this is going to, this is really going to do something. And so they are, they're looking for that aha moment, that gotcha moment. And, and while I think I could have easily, you know, pursued that path and you think you could have easily pursued that path, this was a great dialogue where it just, and the difficulty of this dialogue is it's almost like we were having the discussion that we would have without the class watching. And we kept having to come back to say, okay, well, what's going to be the most beneficial for the class? Is that actually going to help these students? Cause we're going into some of these deep philosophical things and these presuppositions of truth things. And you know, what's our epistemology and we're going into all this. And I'm like, oh, most of the class isn't going to understand this. And so my greatest appreciation for the conversation was that it was real. I'd love to have that conversation just with you in general over a cup of coffee and really keep going down that path. Maybe I'll make a skeptic of you yet. So even a couple of years ago when you got started, I was really debating, okay, should I take time to watch these and actually critique these and say, actually, here's the problem. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I've seen so many YouTube channels turn into just this back and forth battle between YouTube channels. I'm like, you know what? I got no desire if, if I thought it was going to be like this, a real conversation, that's what I appreciate engaging in. But man, I've spent a lot of time doing the back and forth, you know, and I just watch people doing it. And almost, I don't know, if, it almost seems childish now to me to go to do that. And I, I don't say that to be mean to the people that do it. I get why people do it. And I've done it. I just, I go, oh, wouldn't I much rather have a real conversation than a, let me tell all my followers, you know, why he's stupid. And him go, oh, let me tell all my followers why he's stupid. And then, oh, well, he said, you know what I mean? It just, it seemed kind of odd to, to try to do that. But uh, the only problem is now I'm going to have to go start watching some of your videos. I've, I've watched probably four or five of them and I'm like, okay, I got to go watch more Paul's videos. Definitely. Did you get any feedback from the class outside of the conversation on whether they did find it valuable? Yeah, the class emailed me later and said, yeah, really appreciated the conversation. The biggest thing that they took away from that was for the class's perspective, for the students that were watching. I mean, we had like 180 people register for this class. So there was a lot of people, not all of them there for the live, but uh, usually about 100 people, they're emailing going, first of all, we really appreciate the respectful conversation. And I know from my perspective, it really is love. Uh, you know, Paul, I, I would love to see you come to an understanding of where to put your faith. You do have faith. Everybody has faith. You got presuppositions. So where do we put that? What's the most logical, the, the wisest place to put that? And they said, yeah, I, I appreciate the love. That was kind of the biggest lesson to them. And I know because we didn't get into, this wasn't a scientific fact tit for tat, you know, back and forth. This was a, let's get down to the foundation. And then how do we respect? And then your conclusion on if I would ever come back, it would be because of the very thing we've been talking about all week, love. I go, yeah, that, I think you just hit the nail on the head. And that, uh, that was a great sermon you preached there. Thank you. <laughs> My sermon for Christians. Stop trying to argue that there's evidence for Christianity. What's your sermon for atheists? If I were to say atheist, have you thought about why you're arguing? That was kind of one of my biggest questions that I thought about, you know, at the end, throwing at Paul and going, have you considered if what you believe is true, why would you come here and even think about this other side? Why would you debate this other side? Why would you try to prove right and your side prove wrong their side? If your worldview is true, it just seems so pointless. Now, as a Christian, I can make perfect sense of going, look, I desired that you know the truth and that the truth set you free and the real truth's name is Jesus Christ. So understanding why you even argue and why you debate, have you considered why you go on these forums and copy and paste answers that somebody else wrote so that you sound really smart? It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, I don't want my fellow skeptics to merely copy and paste this. But as to why I have these conversations, as far as we know, this is the one and only life that we get. So because of my empathy, I want to encourage people to live their one life in the best way they can, with the most truth that they can, rather than treating it like some kind of mere warm-up for some future life that they will never see. I see my role as a cautionary tale of what happens to a life when one accepts things on authority rather than investigating for themselves. But if we start down that road, it'll be another hour-long conversation. I know. But it'd be a good conversation sometime. I look forward to it. So, 
If anyone wants to check out the full 14 hours of class content that led up to this discussion, you can find that at creationtoday.org under our e-courses. And I really think if you're serious about being online or making fun of Christians, or you really want to be an atheist, I'd encourage you to at least do yourself a favor and check out the other side with Creation Apologetics 101. Cool. Hey, Paul, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And uh, hope you guys know, I'll be praying for you. I appreciate that. We're definitely living in unprecedented times. Look forward to the next time. Me too. And thanks everyone for watching. Until next time. Later.